so I'll, I hope you enjoy um, the story I'm going to tell you, which is about the Kafka adoption in Babel. And I'm not going to talk to you about this type of adoption, which are the books that Franz Kafka wrote. It's not this, uh, this type of adoption. It's uh, how you use Apache Kafka to basically change uh, the fundamentals of uh, how Babel operates. Um, quick things uh, about uh, myself. I'm João, I'm engineering manager for data at Babel. Uh, stuff that I like and that uh, keeps my brain busy is there's distributed systems, uh, databases, uh, how to build uh, resilient and scalable uh, software architectures, uh, machine learning, uh, of course, and uh, blockchain is something that lately has been on, on my mind and to learn some tools and programming languages. Uh, I have GitHub and Twitter, so it's like easy handles. So if you guys want to uh, chat over there, just uh, feel free. And let's keep the ball rolling. So um, I wanted to, to talk to you guys about the story of uh, why did we decide to use Kafka uh, in Unbabel. I'm going to spend uh, a quite amount of time uh, on the first topic, which is the why, because I think it's the, the most important one. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, some of the um, some of the options and things that we consider for technology choices. Uh, how to maximize adoption when launching a new piece of technology, and some of the lessons. Uh, that we learned uh, along the way. So let's start. Uh, part one. Uh, so why did we have to, to change? And uh, I'll, I'll be putting a series of quotes throughout the presentation um, to give more, I think, more context. So like, uh, because most of these things are orthogonal to a lot of things in your life. As, as a wise man once said, well, if you're in hell, your only option is to, to keep going. Um, and uh, as you will see, and I see some familiar faces here, uh, we were in a, a bit of a hell. So our, our goal was to get out of there, uh, ASAP. And quick things about uh, Unbabel. Um, so Unbabel, uh, we're building the world's uh, translation layer. So our vision is to enable uh, anyone to, to understand and be understood in any language. Uh, this means that I can, on the internet, write and express myself in my native language, Portuguese. Uh, and someone, for example, there that lives in China, uh, that lives in, um, in the United States or in Sweden, can see the content that I'm writing, the, that I'm expressing in their native language with native quality. So that's uh, the premise that we have uh, for Unbabel. Uh, we also have our focus in the customer service market. Um, so we're, the vision is to dominate uh, all the communications on the internet, but we want to start with the customer service market. So this leads me to the first um, box here on the left, which we have a set of integrations with systems that companies use. Uh, probably you know some of them, Zendesk, uh, Salesforce, uh, Freshdesk, et cetera. Uh, so we connect to those systems uh, and the agents that use uh, one, of, one or more of those systems can use and babble seamlessly to communicate on multiple languages with their own customers. Um, each of the components has uh, its own database. We have Mongo's and Postgres spread all over the place. Those integrations talk with the systems that uh, 
are that contain our translation pipeline. So our translation pipeline consists in a set of systems that orchestrate all the steps that are necessary to provide a translation, a machine translation. Um, we also have the third uh, box, which is community. So one of the problems with translation is when you're translating conversations, uh, sometimes machine translation uh, is not there. So when you're when you are reaching out to a customer service uh, agent, uh, if you apply only machine translation, the answer sometimes can be robotic, especially if it's long, a long email. It's very easy for the MT to sound a little bit robotic. Uh, or if it's not robotic, uh, some customers have strict guidelines in terms of the tone and the language that they want to, to give when they're providing support. Uh, for that, we have a community of uh, freelancers. Uh, they don't need to be uh, linguists. Uh, they just need to be proficient in one or more, in more than one language. So for example, if I'm Portuguese and I'm fluent in Italian, I can apply to Envavo as an editor. Uh, we have a series of tests that uh, assert that you are qualified to translate in our platform. And then you can, I can have a login and I can uh, have access and get paid for fixing the errors of the DMT. And we have, of course, systems that manage community. And not only on task allocation, but on payments, uh, ratings, etc. Of course, um, we need to extract information for analytics to get uh, an understanding of what's going on. Most of the, the communication is done via HTTP APIs. Uh, some bits of the translation pipeline were done using RabbitMQ. Uh, we're migrating to a new, a new simple translation pipeline that does not have RabbitMQ, but uh, someone eventually will give a talk about this. So how is data extracted for analytics? Um, I think most of you are thinking about uh, the same thing. Hello? Probably right. Hello. Um, so we have uh, this little uh, Kubernetes pod here, which is a custom ETL system that we built that, of course, goes to read-only replicas of some of the systems on the integrations, on the translation pipeline, and on the community. Uh, as, you, as you probably know, this is not very nice. And uh, to make things even better, uh, we use a third-party uh, ETL, ETL tool, uh, because in the beginning, Unbubble was really small and they couldn't basically do uh, everything. And this ETL, ETL tool connected also to read on the replicas of the systems. And lovely, it had no version or source control. So every time we wanted to make a change, we'll need to copy the ETL. Uh, you will need to run it against uh, another database or another schema and hope that uh, a pig log doesn't blow up in your face. And good luck debugging that because the ETL tool only gives the log in the end. It doesn't give you the log in one in each of the individual components. So this led to complex query logic, uh, cognitive load. So we, have, we were a small team, like, uh, and we are a small team, three people a full time with some spies across the company. Uh, and now we have to know the domain model of, made of all the integrations, 90% of the translation pipeline, and all the uh, crazy wicked rules of community. Uh, of course, like this is uh, not scalable and same for anyone. Um, again, a change on the systems require patching the analytics pipeline. So if community did a, a destructive or a, a migration on the database will need to change and multiply that by the number of systems that we were connected to. Of course, this is uh, suboptimal. And last but not least, observability was really hard. Uh, if you want to have a Grafana dashboard or some sense of understanding of, okay, how are things working? Uh, 
how is my pipeline working? Who is help? What's healthy? What's not healthy? Uh, how is the data data quality? How's freshness? Uh, hard? I would probably say impossible. It's not hard. It's impossible. Uh, so this seems really bad, right? But there's more. <laughs> there's actually more. Uh, because in Babel is an AI-driven company, we actually have our own machine translation and some quality estimation systems. This means that someone, and you guess who that someone is, must provide AI teams with data sets that they use to train their models and run their experiments um, with this scenario that we have. Uh, this led to extra overhead because of course, data on the operational systems is not made uh, in a way that's suitable for uh, creating corpus of text to train machine translation models. Uh, that requires some non-trivial representations of data. Some of the data sets were basically matrices of zeros and ones that then plug into NumPy and good luck debugging if something changes there. Um, and we had to create another tool to create and export these data sets to S3, and we call it BOVA. It was kind of our mercenary that went to all of the other systems, extracted, generated corpus of text, and uploaded them to S3. And uh, the, query, the logic of BOVA was not pretty at all. We had, we had some really nasty uh, Mongo, Pandas, and SQL queries all bunched together. So I hope right now I gave you a good understanding of why did we really had to change. So uh, all of these things I said before, uh, cognitive load was, uh, was blowing our brains, uh, steam too small, and uh, impossible to have as a load is not very hard. It's virtually impossible. And of course, we were building bits here and there. There was no sort of modularity where we were not building something uh, uh, sustainable and robust, so yeah, we needed to change. So let's now start uh, telling the part of the story where we actually got ourselves from, from hell. Technology choices, again, uh, Japanese uh, proverb, uh, which I think this was not uh, an easy road. And this talk is about, uh, this quote is about perseverance, which I think embodies a lot of the, the hard work that we had to, mm -hmm. to do on the way and we're still doing. Uh, so we did some, more, some thinking and some architecture decisions. Uh, we decided to expose information between systems using domain events, which is something that I used in the past and we proved to be uh, quite good. Um, we would deny uh, very, uh, on very energetic way, uh, access to production read on the replicas. So that will, they will be locked and uh, no one will, will go there anymore. And all data sets that we, we will generate will be derived from event data. So uh, about technology. Uh, so we were using events, so we need a streaming system. Uh, first, our team was, was small. We didn't want to become data ops, SRE, or DevOps, whatever you call it, so we couldn't manage to manage infrastructure. So we needed something that someone in the cloud would host for us. Uh, we wanted something that uh, was battle tested. Uh, widely adopted, mature, with a strong community, and efficient for the use case. Uh, suitable for event sourcing, because we were changing, systems will change events, and we will derive information on data sets from those events, so we need to uh, be suitable for event sourcing, and with good Python support. So in Babel, uh, has a lot of Python code. When we started this effort, Python was the only programming language besides C++, but because no one wants to code in C++ besides the MT guys, we didn't want to introduce a new programming language. Now we have Go, uh, but at the time, like uh, one of the requirements that we had to keep things simple and to increase adoption was like, let's work with Python. People know Python, let's work with Python. Um, so on the events, 
uh, talking about the binary format on which we would um, which would use to send events. We wanted something that was efficient from a payload size. Uh, strong types. Uh, so events uh, are going to be our API and we want to have uh, strong contracts with strong types. Uh, even, uh, especially because we're using a dynamic language uh, such as Python. So that would save us from uh, horrendous bugs, for example, by JSON. Uh, and have mappers of JSON to something else. And we wanted this binary format to be totally programming language agnostic um, to avoid when introducing new programming languages in the future, uh, this would still work. So our choices, streaming systems, surprise, surprise, it's Kafka because of all the things I said before and all of the stuff that you heard out there, like everyone is using Kafka for for all these reasons, um, they're more than valid and true. And for binary format, we we selected Rollbuff because uh, checks all the boxes, and we have uh, at the time uh, already in-house experience. And there was a shift that was starting to get to get some traction, which was to use our internal services use using gRPC, uh, migrate our services to use gRPC. So introducing Prolobuff was a natural uh, contender and would match that, that effort, as opposed to something as Ava, uh, for example. Part three, um, maximizing adoption. So, and the quote is from Michael Gordon. Um, so this uh, this quote it, like embodies uh, teamwork, and uh, when when the team uh, set up to this task to okay let's change how and Babel moves data and works with data on the operational systems, uh, we were our maximum sizes of data engineers we were three plus one and the plus one. Um, but we had to change virtually all the systems. So we had to count with the, the help of everyone to, to accomplish that. So why is adoption important? Yes, we were a small team, three plus one, now two plus one. Change was, was big. It's like virtually all in level systems with some minor exceptions. And we wanted to set a new standard. We, want to, we wanted to have people not thinking, okay, I, I need to send, my system needs to, need to speak to the outside, so I need to send an event to Kafka. Uh, and, if, and that's the standard that we wanted to, to enforce. Um, and on that road, we defined uh, some, some metrics. So like, what does success looks like? Uh, so we, we, we wanted to focus on like three things that we believe were important. Uh, the first one is the number of teams uh, slash engineers that use our tools, our products, and follow our standard. Uh, are we going to get eyes on this new thing that we're going to build? So is observability going to be easy or something? Uh, in the past, we had nothing. And uh, developer happiness. So like uh, working with uh, side by side with other engineers in the novel and uh, assess how they're feeling about uh, how our, our tools, our processes, and continue, continue to improve them. So how do we do that? Uh, tooling, tooling, and pair programming. Um, so we developed three components uh, slash tools, uh, and I'm going to talk uh, each, and of, each one of them uh, right away. Uh, so for tooling, we we develop we had the the idea of that we kind of copied from Google of having a repository with all the proto files that have the events. Uh, so all the the proto files uh, are in one GitLab repo. We have uh, we make sure that all the events have proper descriptions. And we have code generation and publishing to our internal architect repositories every time a new tag is pushed to this repo. 
And we also have a command that automatically generates HTML uh, documentation. So it's so easy for any engineer to have more information about each of those events without digging, without having to dig into the problem of code or even product managers if they are uh, brave enough. So adding uh, events, for example, in Python is a poetry app in bubble events. If you import a class, you have your event. You're good to go. So this as easy uh, as it gets. Now, tooling two, uh, producers and consumers. So we wanted to make the adoption uh, very simple, but we also want, we didn't want people to use Kafka in their own way. We wanted consistency and we wanted simplicity. So these were the two reasons that we have decided to build this tooling. And uh, if you copy paste this uh, into an unbubble system, uh, changing if you're running a pod on the right Kubernetes cluster, this will work. Uh, you just need to change the local host to whatever, whatever things and put the, the right TLS credentials. And this will work. It's very simple. Developers are used to it. Uh, it already has retry logic. Uh, built in. Uh, it's very simple, extendable. It's a library, you just need to poetry, poetry install, gramophone, and you're ready to go. It uses bubble events to, to send the, the event to Kafka. Uh, for consuming events, basically the same, same thing. You have all the, the, the setup being done here. You subscribe to setup topics. And then you have an iterator that gives you a message, a set of messages, and then you just do whatever you want in the game commit. Uh, this is simple. We wanted uh, engineers to, to be comfortable and use uh, abstractions that they already know to maximize adoption. And uh, this was a, the, the library is very small. And this was a, a nice way to have a good adoption and to, to make sure that things are consistent. Some of you might be thinking, why is this tooling necessary? Why don't not using the raw Python driver? Because I talk about consistency, but there's another thing. So when we publish events to Kafka, uh, we don't publish this. We publish this. So this is a special protobuf. Uh, the event goes into the payload. So the event goes here. Uh, we have a unique identifier for the event. We have a source that tells which is the system that sent this event. And we have this thing here, which we call it like schema definition. Um, because we didn't want to have a centralized uh, schema registry, uh, we decided to encode on this, uh, on this envelope the, the directory where the, the message is on the GitLab repo. So there, like, in, for example, in Python, we can use this uh, to basically get the class uh, that uh, represents the event in real time. This also has an interesting thing. So this decouples completely the format that we use to send events. If somewhere down the line in the future we decide, I don't know, to use JSON for some reason or some other weird format, we just need to change the schema definition the payload is a, it's a byte array, and then the tooling adapts to this, um, this complexity. So the engineer will say, I'm sending an event. This, this is it. And then the tooling abstracts all of this for, from the engineer. It gives us more flexibility to evolve in the future. Uh, last but not least, uh, again, consistency. We wanted one code base where we could have all of our stream processors. Uh, to have everything close to, to each other, making sure like the, we reuse some components. For example, I've imposed this on like database rights. Uh, Prometheus integration already built in. So if you follow, if you use this set of components, you already have a lot of goodies for free. So we wanted to write in consumers, uh, some processors to be so easy that you wouldn't think about using anything else. So it already integrates with, uh, with our logging system. It already integrates with Prometheus. You have like for free all the metrics that you need to, 
monitor your consumer. So you need to, to write uh, selectors, which are filter functions, and mappers, which are map operations. With these combinations, uh, on our current use cases, developers can do whatever they want. Uh, so it's uh, in terms of developer uh, productivity, this was, a, uh, this was a big boost for them. It gives us a little bit more time to get this right, but in the end, I think, and as I'm going to, to tell you guys in the next section, uh, I think this, uh, this really helps uh, other engineers that, that work in this code base. Uh, adoption results. Since um, May 2020, after pandemic, uh, coronavirus, uh, zombie apocalypse, like uh, the world is going to end, um, from April until now, we have uh, three internal teams using our tools, uh, which, was, which was really nice. Uh, all the three, so the events, uh, the emission, and uh, the consumers. Uh, we migrated uh, four analytics pipelines, so from the, the chat product, the tickets product, which, are, uh, which is kind of quite complex, uh, community pipeline, and a new pipeline regarding AI metrics, so um, automated metrics that AI people use to when training their models. And uh, we also are in, well, yeah, we're going to deploy next week in production, uh, a new system, uh, event source system for corpus generation. So remember when I told, when I presented that little uh, on that image with Boba Fett. Uh, so Boba Fett will now go and reach from this system instead of going to all of those weird uh, other systems and have some complex logic. Uh, all of this with the core team first of four people, then three people, and yeah, so this was a hell of a ride. Uh, yeah, we were blind, but now we see. So this is a screenshot uh, in production that I took like two or three days ago. Uh, it has a bug on the bulk insert latency that we will fix. Uh, but it gives us some eyes of, for example, when was the last event that we successfully consumed? So that we consume, we process it, and then we store something else. Uh, what's the life, the uptime of the system? And then here we, we see all of the, uh, not all of them, but some of the uh, stream processors that we have. And we also have another Defender dashboard with uh, the rest of the infrastructure. So we were blind, but now we see and that's, that uh, allows us to sleep better at night. Uh, part four. Uh, lessons learned. Uh, last quote, I promise. Uh, this is like Captain Obvious, but I, I always like it. Um, so I decided to split the lessons learned into two areas. The first one is uh, more, uh, it's not related to technology, but how you approach uh, uh, picking one. Uh, first, you have to, to be able to sell it to wherever you need to, to sell. I need to explain like why you need it. Why is the status quo uh, not good enough? Uh, what are the problem, problems that you solve? Uh, and can't you solve the problems with tools that you already know? Uh, because sometimes you have hard problems, but with the right combination of tools that you and people in your organization know, they can be solved. For example, when decided of, before decided on having the main events, one, we had three options. We, we had two options beside events. One of them was using change data capture. Uh, we dropped it because of uh, complexity. And then we, won, we had the Amazonian way, which was have reporting APIs for basically everything. And uh, we decided that, you okay, know, uh, events is the, is the right place to, to go. We have people with experience, uh, so let's, uh, let's work with it. And last but not least, is it worth investing? Because it's like a marriage, a long, long term marriage. So if you pick a technology, you have to look at it. So you need to be absolutely sure that it's worth your investment. 
Uh, be customer centric. This is probably the, the last thing you prob you were expecting to listen in the technical talk, but you need to know who will use your tech. Uh, you need to keep your your customers, in this case, or in the engineers, uh, happy. Uh, we need to minimize their uh, entry and adoption barriers. Uh, probably need to you will need to do pair programming. Uh, we did. Uh, with some of the engineers that, that work with us on this, um, you are biased, of course, because if you if you have a good use case uh, and you have sold it well, uh, you study it a lot, and uh, probably you will be tempted to think, oh, look, we have smart people, engineers are smart, they will figure it out. Um, you'll be surprised that. Uh, Besides, like people are smart, but sometimes, like because we invested so much time and effort on uh, selecting and deepening your knowledge in that technology, um, they will miss things that you consider uh, trivial. Mm -hmm. A word that I hate, but I think it's uh, it's uh, it has its uh, its stage here. Uh, we. <clears throat> we did some internal tech talks to share knowledge with our engineers and we attempted to write exceptional documentation. So documentation that uh, if you follow that, uh, it will work uh, for, for the basics. Mm -hmm. And this way, the documentation was something that we really put uh, effort uh, into doing it besides the internal tech talks. Um, and last but not least on this subject, like don't be greedy. So like uh, it's not your piece of tech unless you build it. And even if you build it, uh, it's only successful if it's uh, if it spreads like a fire. If the more people we have using it, um, the more uh, success will will be evident. Uh, you have to be humble. Sometimes people will question. Sometimes people will say, oh, but this takes too long. Uh, why can't I just go in and do a select and a join uh, on the database? I need to be humble and you need to let go of your bias and uh, try to, to win people to, to your side. On the lessons learned, on the technical side, event sourcing is quite nice. Uh, when you don't have side effects, for example, we still don't have payments running here. Uh, when we have payments, it might not get so nice. So we might need to be um, aware of some things, some side effects that might happen when processing information. Uh, fixing data problems is so much easier these days. Uh, we just remit events. Uh, we just fix bugs in the stream processor and reprocess everything from the beginning. Uh, is it worth investing on it, event sourcing? It's probably not for everything. They need to pick uh, which are the use cases. Um, but I think for the use cases that we picked to tackle this, which was reporting and data set generation for AI, uh, I think they are, um, event sourcing is a, is a suitable approach. Kafka's observability, like the default one, is not great. So in the past, as in Babel and previous company I worked, we used RabbitMQ. Uh, RabbitMQ ships with a UI. It's not perfect, but you can have an understanding of uh, what the hell is happening over there. Uh, Kafka ships with a bunch of CLI tools. Uh, you have a lot, we had to have manual work in order to have visibility on producer and consumer. What does it mean for a producer to be healthy? What does it mean for a consumer to be healthy? Uh, it's not as trivial as you think. And then last but not least, uh, you have Zookeeper. It's the, um, the red sheep, the, the black sheep that comes with Kafka. They're working hard to get rid of it. Uh, we have some metrics on Zookeeper. We use Amazon's uh, managed service for Kafka. We have some metrics on Zookeeper, uh, but Zookeeper is one of those things that we kind of pray uh, it stays okay. Uh, if it doesn't, well, it's a weirdo. 
we need to go there and fix it. Uh, but yeah, Zookeeper is a bit of um, in a mess. So protocols and schemas. Um, I, the solution that we had for basically having the configuration and the schema inside the messages, inside the envelope, uh, is working really well for us. We don't need to connect with an event with a schema registry, so we have we don't have a spot uh, there, and uh, it gets more complexity on the tooling. Uh, but I think it's it's work that uh, paid off. Um, so the schema registry as a mirror of the repository structure is working real well. You might be asking, so what if you decide to change the repo structure? Uh, yeah, it's going to be messy. We'll need to. Mm -hmm change tooling and probably have versioning on the tooling. Uh, but it's, um, it's something that we are uh, aware that might happen in the future. Uh, because the tooling works with envelopes and we don't publish the raw events, that, uh, that, will, become e that will be easier in the future. But that's something like uh, that is uh, a potential for some friction. And uh, speaking of friction, uh, default values on protobufs might not be your friends, especially integers and booleans. They default to zeros and false. Um, most of the time, that's not a problem. Uh, sometimes uh, it can be. Um, I don't recall. Uh, I remember an example, which was we had um, this was with an enum, so we had an enum, for example, a, that had uh, some machine translation uh, engines, and the default was the generic and bubble engine. And there was a case where we had a bug, and they basically put some nonsense there, uh, yeah. and it was hard to basically distinguish between between both. So Perlobov is cool, but they have some nuances. So watch out for the default values. And I think that's all. So thanks for your attention. Uh, questions, mm -hmm. or curiosities, uh, feel free to, to shoot. Yeah, you can unmute or put in the chat if you, you don't prefer to don't talk, but it's better you can talk. <coughs> Someone's done. The first one is the hardest. <laughs> Thank you. Do right, you have an idea about you know, the volumes, for example, of uh, of events you are processing, or is if for you you don't have maybe a big mm. business event, you don't have a lot of uh, would say a large volume because it's more business event maybe. Um, so we we still don't. I don't remember the the num. I don't have the numbers in my head, but we, mm. the volume is still not big uh, because, for example, on the machine translation pipeline. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of steps, like mm. more than uh, da, 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 almost 20 okay. uh, steps that happen. Uh, and, it, and they can have, and not, none of them are sequential. There are some, mm -hmm. some stuff that can diverge and go to other parts of, of the DAG. Uh, but for example, all of those uh, steps were not emitting events. So we are only mm. focusing on the, the little bits on the system that are required to, to have the analytics components working. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, if I go here, so if you, if you see like this event, it's what we mm -hmm. call a fat one. So mm -hmm. every time a chat message is translated, we mm -hmm. send this, which is quite big. For example, this translation data uh, payload, this message, mm -hmm. has a lot of information regarding to the internal representation of text. Mm -hmm. uh, in the future, 
uh, we might have to to instrument some smaller uh, parts and be more more go deeper into the pipeline in other parts of the system to mm -hmm. to know what's happening. Uh, but again, it's uh, it's about adoption. So we identified the problem that we wanted to fix, which were mm -hmm. the analytics components of our systems, which were uh, mm -hmm. causing us a lot of pain. Uh, these extractions from the raw entities, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we work with, with that. Uh, once we start to be more granular, and for example, a lot of actions that happen in community we're not uh, collecting. Uh, mm -hmm. yet. Uh, yeah, that will be that will be messy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we want we will need to have a team bigger than three or two plus people yeah. to handle that. Um, uh, do you have any case of sensible data on events? What do you mean sensible data? <laughs> I imagine customer data, maybe linked to GDPR, etc. Yeah. Or, uh, yes, or password, or you want to hash, or if you, where yeah. you have some uh, security so, requirement. Or, mm -hmm. uh, good question. So every so everything that goes to, to Kafka, uh, we have a system called Eraser uh, that is responsible for stripping all the PII. Mm -hmm. So we replace, for example, PII with uh, placeholders like card number, phone number, email, uh, stuff like that. So all mm -hmm. of that information is the one that is used, for example, for the AI models. The AI models never see PII. So PII mm -hmm. is, uh, is stored on this very uh, uh, unaccessible part on the translation pipeline, of course. And when the translation pipeline finishes, the last step is replacing the placeholders with the correct PII. So there's no PII ever being sent to to so it's a, it's a conversation, but the PII is replaced by placeholders. So we don't have this, um, that sort of problems. That was one of the requirements that we, that we put in the first place. We didn't okay, thank you. put PII across the system. <laughs> it's to be where, it, where it should be, it's like locked and inaccessible. Uh, choice was related to Malator knowledge. Um, good question. Um, so, in the we when we decided for the uh, binary format, there were like three options on the table. There was JSON that we only put there because yeah, to be yeah JSON with JSON schema, but that's uh, not the thing. We had Avro. And we had Prolobov. Uh, we picked Prolobov. Well, it's uh, binary-wise, it's efficient. Um, I wouldn't probably say that internal knowledge was the the feature that had the biggest relevance. Sorry, this was very nerdy, but it wasn't the the thing that had the most importance. Mm -hmm. um, what I think had um, did the the actual uh, was the, the arbiter between Prodovov and, and Avro was we were talking internally of replacing some of the HTTP APIs with uh, gRPC APIs. Uh, gRPC are made using Prodovov. Um, so that was a natural way of, okay, mm -hmm. like if we're going for Prodo for gRPC for some APIs, we need to, we will need to use Prodovov. So if you're going to already invest in Perlovov, so why don't we use uh, events over Perlovov? We did a small POC, just want to get uh, an understanding. Okay, like how does Perlovov work? With, will this be okay for us? Yeah. Um, I, I think, I hope it answers the, the question. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, we also put Drift. Uh, over there, but uh, just for mm -hmm. adding one more. Now that I recall, it was the option was all, always between novel and Prolobot. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. One more question, maybe? Let's see. Mm -hmm. No? No. Okay. So I will just, uh, just put the, the NPS, uh, your feedback on the meetup will appear. You just need to put uh, the writing and then we'll, uh, we'll see the result. But, uh, but thanks for, to all of you for your time. I know it's end of the day, end of the week, etc. So start of the school and all that type of constraints. So thanks for all being uh, present and we announce next meetup soon. So and feel free to suggest or contact with me or LinkedIn or meetup if you want to suggest uh, a meetup or uh, something you would like to be talk here. Okay. So I just start the pooling if you can just uh, fill it before leaving and see you at the next meetup. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye bye. Stop sharing.